Hello, everybody. My name is Vicky Terkilsen. I am a broadcast journalist with the Danish Broadcasting Corporation. I will be moderating this session, which will be in English. Um, the session is titled The Future of Feminism and the Women's Movement in the North. Since our world leaders met in Beijing in 1995 and agreed upon a number of fine goals on women's rights and gender equality, there hasn't been another world conference on women's rights. This is a particular shame considering that a lot of the Nordic countries still haven't fulfilled their promises towards the goals set in Beijing. That is why we are here today, to remind them of these goals and to further develop the discussion on women's rights and gender equality. By the end of the Nordic Forum, there will be a final document formulating demands and specific proposals directed to the Nordic governments and politicians involved in future gender politics. But before we are able to formulate demands and suggestions, we also need to put into words what these challenges are and the challenges facing feminism today, some of the challenges we need to face before we can move forward. We may have come far, but there is still plenty to do and to point towards some of the areas that should not be forgotten in a session on the future of feminism. I would like to welcome the session's participants. Um, closest to me is uh, Mila Pykkönen, who is from Finland and who is a general secretary at the Feminist Association Union. Next to her is Bende Rosenbeck, who is a professor at the Scandinavian Studies and Linguistics of University of Copenhagen. And then we have from Norway, Toril Skard, who is a psychologist, researcher, and former politician for the Socialist Left Party. And next to her again, we have Ebbe Wittbratström, who is from Sweden and a professor in literature. And finally, at the end, Kristin Astgeersdottir from Iceland, who is a director at the Icelandic Center of Gender Equality. The session here on stage will last until... Uh, 1.20, after which there will be room for a couple of questions from the audience, but only for the, for the last 10 minutes. I would, however, encourage you all, if you have suggestions going towards this particular topic, if you have any suggestions towards what, should, what are the challenges of feminism uh, in the North, then please write them down on uh, pieces of paper that you can find over on the high table there. Uh, and they will be uh, taken from the rapporteur who is here and who is also taking notes on the debate taking, taking place here at this session. And all of these notes and your proposals will somehow be, uh, uh, be taken into the final document, the, the final document that will be handed over to our politicians at the end of Nordic Forum. Prior to this meeting, I've asked... The, uh, the panel participants here uh, to point towards what they see as the biggest challenges for fem feminism today. And I'll give each of them five minutes to speak uh, on the, the biggest challenges they see it. Um, and uh, to kick it off, Mila, would, uh, would you like to start? Yes, I can. Um, do you hear me? Okay. Good. Um, so, my name is Milla Pykkönen, and I'm General Secretary of uh, Feminist Association Unioni of Finland. I've been working there for six months now, so I'm relatively new. And I'm Master of Social Science, and my master thesis, they were about um, uh, 2010 um, leftist feminism in Finland at the moment, could say. And as a theory, I used post-feminism and critique of post-feminism. And from this same theme comes the ideas that I see the biggest challenges at the moment. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges of uh, feminism in, in Nordic countries in, at the moment, nowadays, is uh, individualism. And individualism that you, uh, avoids using categories, example, men and women. If we see people just as individuals, uh, we forget the power structures behind the individuals. For example, gender regime uh, that defines our position in society. And I think there is a um, big possibility that we could become so-called gender blind if we don't see the power structures. In the other hand, we need to see people 
as individuals, not just as men and women. Women are definitely not a privileged group. So women, as a group, they face similar kind of problems all over the world because of their gender. But discrimination that women face can be intersectional. For, exam for example, in Scandinavia, women with immigration background can face discrimination uh, because of their gender and because of their ethnicity. Or a woman with uh, some other sexual orientation than straight can face problems, discrimination because of their sexual orientation and because of their gender. So women's movement must work with anti-racist movement, LGBT rights movement, and so on. Because minority groups, they usually face the uh, same problems than women with the patriarchal power structure. And in Scandinavia, we could say that we cheat ourselves, that we already have equality here. Because um, we pretty much, uh, we have same rights and the laws says that there are equal rights for everyone. But same rights and laws are not enough because of the structures behind. And I've seen that there's also some feminists nowadays thinking that societies should just cover same rights to everybody. And it's not a problem if there is a huge gender unequality in some places. For example, nursing of young children or using the parental leaves. Or there's also feminists who say that uh, the gender unbalance in prostitution is not a problem, that almost 100% of the prostitution are the women and buyers are men, because it's all about the rights, so they don't so much think about the unequality there. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and uh, Bente, I know that you have some points to make about women in academia and uh, maybe also in particular the way that academia is used towards uh, gender equality. Exactly. The floor is yours. Uh, Use the microphone, um, please. I'm uh, in gender studies. Uh, I started as an activist in the 1970s in the red stocking movements, Rødstromperne. Uh, I was very active, but I also studied. I later became, I graduated, I became a researcher. I was also in the 80s member of the Danish Kvinderåd. Uh, but from the 80s and then in the 90s, I, I, I will characterize myself as an academic activist because it wasn't easy to, to get gender or women's studies into the university. So I have used my activism at the universities and that's also where I'm from this, that position that I'm talking uh, today. So I have been in Oslo in 1988, where we made a Queen University in 1994 in Åbo. Uh, and uh, after, I can tell you, after Oslo, we uh, got a coordinator in women's studies. After Åbo, we had Nick uh, and a coordinator in men's studies. So there have been a lot of uh, results. Um, there are also a lot of results in, 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 in women's studies, so if I'm going to talk about what the challenges are today, I will say that, that what we need is mainstreaming. We have to mainstream gender into research and, and, and science. And I would also say something what we can contribute with from women's studies, because I think when I read this uh, this uh, program or these demands, I can see that, that, that the research and knowledge are called for in several themes. So I, I really think that, that we, when we get support to mainstream gender at the universities in all our courses, when we are able to establish science and research in gender, and when we are able to mainstream gender in science and research, we can help with um, promoting these, uh, these demands. And then I will also have a small comment about the new generation. One of the demands uh, is about that we need a new generation when it comes to innovation. And I must say that, that we have a lot of the students at uh, Copenhagen University 
I cannot say that uh, gender studies or women's studies um, are on top in, in Denmark, but anyway, we have uh, several courses and a lot of students, some of them sitting there, and they are very active. And I, I think what we also need is uh, a new generation because new ideas for me, come from activists and it comes from uh, younger, younger um, women and, and, and men. And I can say that they have made a journal, Friction, perhaps they can tell us about that. So, so I see a lot of um, things going on at a grassroots level, but it's, it's, uh, it's difficult, you know, to, to um, get into the heart of research and, 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 and science. So that's what we need, and, and there are a few places in the, in the demands where I can see that, that um, they are talking about uh, career in academia, and, and there we have a problem, so I, which I hope we can get support to solve. And the other uh, parties that I hope that, that women's studies, gender studies can contribute on, on, on uh, several themes. And, and as Mila mentioned, she mentioned intersectionality, and uh, that's what people are doing at the university uh, nowadays. Theories about intersectionality is, is, is growing and, and can be used in, in uh, these uh, various demands. But, Bente, if I can just ask you to elaborate a little bit on the mainstreaming part. Can you just uh, put uh, into words uh, in what ways in particular that you'd like to see mainstreaming within the academia? You know, it's because there are a lot of knowledge about uh, women. There are, we have a lot of knowledge about gender, but nobody uses it. We have to implement uh, this uh, to, to get this knowledge integrated into the curriculum, into research program, etc. And then there is also there is a, there have been uh, some uh, small initiative about uh, the Nordic country. This book, the Nordic region, a step closer to gender balance in research. And uh, this book says that only uh, uh, twenty percent of um, of the, the, the academic staff are women. So, so that's, a, that's a big challenge. So, so we're talking about quotas, and if, if yes. we want to go into, into the mainstreaming part, then you're yes. talking about, but, but you know, you if research to, is going to be done. You have to have a done. better balance, gender balance, in order to mainstream. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, confident with that these 80% male professors will... Uh, integrate gender in curriculum and into research. So you think that it takes it need, you need more women we in need, the academic staff yes. before we're going to see gender mainstreaming exactly. within research? We need, we need a, a better gender balance and then we need a gender dimension in research and science. Okay. Torrid, um, the floor is yours. <clears throat> well, I became a member of the Norwegian Association for Women's Rights in 1954, so I've seen a long perspective, and I think it's extremely important to define what we mean about feminism. I think it's important to see that it is generally about the subordination of women as a group in relation to men as a group. And it is about basically about a social structure that gives power, status, and resources differently to women and to men. We just celebrated our 100 years of women's suffrage in Norway last year. But it was not the male-dominated parliament who wanted to do that. It was not the government either. When women's movement asked to do it, the, the, the Ministry for Equality and Children was asked if they could do a little bit. And uh, when we compare it with the celebration now for our, our, our constituents, uh, constitution, which was in 1814, I mean, it's a class difference. And so, but also when we got women's right to vote in 1913, it took two generations before anything basically happened. And when did it happen? It happened when the second feminist movement came and put on pressure and women organized and women were, became conscious and we got women friendly laws, we got education for women, we got women in the workplace and we got uh, women in politics. Feminism kind of seemed accepted. And uh, we even uh, ratified the CEDO, the convention, and I think this is important, the convention on the elimination of discrimination against women. It is not a convention on equality in general. It is not a convention on gender equality in general. It's a convention on the dis against the discrimination of women, which is part of gender. 
And uh, there, if you look at, the, at, at this CEDA, which we all have ratified, I mean, excuse me, there's a lot to be done. And I can remind you of, for example, Article 3, where it says that all measures should be taken in, within uh, economic, p social, and cultural, s political spheres to reassure, ensure women full and complete development and progress so they can um, use their rights, human rights, and their basic freedoms as well as men can. And if you look at the situation in Norway, it's a bit different in the different Nordic countries. We see that the, the, the measures to, to follow up this have been, to put it mildly, rather limited. I would like to bring to your attention the, the social scientist Harriet Holter, who in the 1970s actually warned us because she said, be careful, under the late development of capitalism, the discrimination of women will change character. It will go from directly visible, personal, and physical material to indirectly invisible, structural, and psychological. That means that those who defend the power and the tradition, they will use their suppression techniques, which it also has uh, talked about, to, to cover up. To, so we don't see the different, the, the, the un, injustice. So we don't uh, get real contents to our demands. So we are, we are co-opted. We are, we are given a, a great embrace, but they take the contents out of it. And when talking about mainstreaming, it is on the, on men's conditions. And so we have called it male streaming Be <laughs> because there is a very basic uh, power difference. And in this situation, it is extremely important to have an active women's movement who looks at what's the, how society really is. Knowledge, training, 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 education, education, knowledge, critical analysis, and, and uh, taking the, uh, apart the different suppression techniques and showing uh, what it really is about. And in that situation, it is both very more important than before to have an active women's movement, but also more difficult. And we see it very difficult in Norway. And therefore, we think the demands that the, that the, that the government should give resources to the women's movement broadly is extremely important. And a number of areas, and just give one sentence about a number of areas, they're not doing it. They're not giving support to women's organizations, not to women's research, not to study work, not to the U women university in the Nordic countries. And, then, and so the important demand now is we must have possible possibilities to make our voice heard, to, to act the way the convention has, has said, and you have said that we should to make a proper democracy. Thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> to, just to, to, to sum up, because if, if you're going to sum up your, your main, uh, the main problem for feminism today, just, just one problem, because, you know, to make our voices heard, we're here today. We're actually, we're, we're voicing our concerns. So just to make one of your, of the problems that you see that feminism in the North is facing today, then what would that be? It's a problem of language that is covering up the reality. So, so I mean, the nice language it, that doesn't... Yeah. <laughs> it, they call it, they call it Likestillingslande, mm -hmm. the land of equality. And they don't, and when we look at it, there are great differences that they don't tell about. Thank you. So breaking the veil. And uh, next we have uh, Ebe Witt, and, uh, and Ebe, I know that you're, you're, uh, you, you have at least one uh, point uh, to make where you disagree with one of the panelists here. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no well, don't you, take you, that at once. No, no, I no, don't no, disagree you, that much. And no, but, but it's about, with, you know, where does change start? So, but, but Ebe, please, okay. uh, please okay. present your uh, points. Oh, I just want to say I love the way you're this kind of hardcore feminist, Toril. <laughs> Um, and so am I, I guess. I'm an academician, um, and, um, but I'm, uh, I can't stop being an activist. So this is uh, very problematic <laughs> in a way and very stimulating in another. I've be also been, uh, um, so to speak, a women's lib activist from the 1970s. 
uh, when I was in the uh, Feminist Socialist Organization Group 8, the nearest one to the red stockings. So we were really oldies but goldies here. And, um, and the red stockings were very inspiring to us. Um, so um, I also um, participated, of course, in the, the starting up of women's studies uh, at the university, um, namely in Stockholm. And um, I'd just like to make one, um, how I say, <laughs> advertisement. Please go into the net and look at what we did in uh, women's literary studies in those days. You can for free go in uh, on Nordic women's literature and read 850 women who have been writing and changing the world for a thousand years, and it's for free. So that's something. This is knowledge that should be spread and implemented. Women have always been there. Women have always had their strategies of resistance. So um, then I, uh, so I didn't stop uh, being an activist. The 80s ca came and uh, in Sweden, as I believe also in our other Nordic countries, suddenly it was out with feminism and the women's stuff. Um, but we kept on moving and for the elections in 1995, when women for the first time had we women representation in, in the parliament, uh, had gone backwards for the first time in, in the history, uh, we started the, the support stockings. Anybody remember the support stockings? Yeah. <laughs> we had great fr fun. It was a secret network. This is also one of the ways that we could still use today. It was a secret network, uh, and a lot of uh, the participants were like uh, Vicky, uh, working in the media. Wonderful. But nobody knew that there were support stockings. Uh, only three of us were, were officially, uh, so the, well, we were the three official support stockings. But we changed the world. Uh, because um, every second a woman in government and in party, we threatened to start a woman's party. This was never what we wanted to do. We are we were for mainstreaming, for feminist issues and feminist perspectives and gender balance in all parties. But this is what we threatened uh, to do. And um, so uh, we got this. Sweden got the first government and parliament that was then gender equal. This was the last. And this is my point now. This was the last manifestation of ma what I would call majority feminism. Uh, in Sweden, it was, uh, and by this I mean the the movement from uh, well from French Revolution and on, on onwards uh, that uh, fought and fight not only for equality but also for upgrading skills and experiences that women have got from the division of labor in patriarchy, and also of course from the gender inequality. Uh, plus their cultural history, difference in ethics, and so forth. In the 20th century, now you understand what I mean, majority feminism scored, and we got at least the likestillingspolitik, <laughs> the likestilling feminism, the state feminism, that is something that uh, welfare state uh, studies talk about that we have in the Nordic countries. Um, the academic discipline, in Sweden we have as a separate academic discipline, gender studies. Uh, this is not a very good idea, I think, because this should be in all disciplines, a gender perspective and a feminist perspective, but we have a special gender discipline. Um, and with this, and with the growing of this gender discipline, a shift came from, say, Simone de Beauvoir's existential feminism of lived experience to Butler's constructive gender performance theory. 
So uh, majority feminism, where women are always seen uh, as, so to speak, the woman's oppression, the oppression of women has a priority, even if you have an intersexual perspective, which you must have, but women, that, that's a priority. It became uh, not overnight, but more and more difficult to uh, promote this idea. Maybe I had my five minutes. No, I, I just need you to, so what to we point have to, out yeah, you know, so the what biggest we ha yeah. challenge for us as feminists in the North. Yeah, it's it, to combine majority feminism with the minor, uh, minority feminisms that we have got. And this can be studied in the feminist uh, initiative party that we have in Sweden now, which is not a feminist party. It is an intersexual party. Fine with me, but we need something more. And I would say not a feminist party, but more uh, a feminist movement where d women with all kinds of, I mean, we could talk of differences between women. Uh, and this is what we do all the time in Sweden. But uh, the difference in power, the power structure and, and uh, what Tore talk, talked about regarding men as a group and male structures, patriarchal structures. But should should be more um, underlined. But I, I, I don't understand. Should these groups combine their agendas or should they just work together? How do you see that? They should combine their agendas and work together. Both. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and Kristen? Um, I'm sorry if, if I don't say your last name correctly. Estkaya Stottir? Something like that. Stottir. Okay. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> yes, my name is uh, Kristin Oskestottir, and I'm now uh, the director for the Center for Gender Equality in, in Iceland, which is a public institution under the Ministry of Welfare. I'm a, as these ladies, I'm a, I've, I've been an activist for a very long time. I was in the Icelandic red stocking movement, movement, and I was one of the founders of the Women's Alliance, the Women's Party in Iceland. And I was a member of parliament for the Women's Party for eight years. Then I worked in Kosovo for UNIFEM, so uh, working with women in, in, in Kosovo. So I have a uh, a long experience working on, on gender issues and I'm also a historian and, and I have studied the history of the women's movement in Iceland. So I must say I, I, I very much agree with the ladies sitting here, here with me. But uh, uh, thinking about the, the future of feminism, I, I, was, I have been wondering if uh, we here in the Nordic countries are asking the right questions, whether we are looking at the most important issues in the world. And I, when I say this, I, I've just come, uh, last week there was a, a Nordic, well, international Nordic conference in Iceland. Iceland is now chairing the Council of Nord, uh, the Nordic Council of Ministers. And there was this conference on men and masculinities. And I was listening, among others, to Michael Kimmel, who will be speaking here. And, you know, what he is, is telling us about what's going on in the United States and uh, uh, where these right-wing extremist groups are growing. He, he said that they now have about 200,000 members, uh, about 500,000 people connected to them, and they are extremely active on their social media. And they are using the language of Nazism the, you know, the pictures from Nazism against Jews and against women. And we see these same uh, kinds of, of, of groups in, in the Nordic uh, countries. And we see, I, I think, I'm afraid, we see growing uh, anti-feminism. And I, I think that this is something that we really need to look at. Connected with masculinities and all, all these different kinds of, of, of masculinities, or what uh, Michael Kimmel calls angry white men. And, and, and at the same time, uh, this, is, this is one area which I think that would, uh, we, we feminists really need to, to focus on, how to analyze this and not at least how to compete it, how, what can we do.
that I think that would be very interesting. And then the environmental questions and war and peace. You, what we have been seeing in the world for the last five years, what has been going on in North Africa, Syria, Congo, you, we see all this terrible violence against women in all of these countries. And you know, this is so heartbreaking. And what, what, can, we, what can we do? So it's masculinities, and how can we change them? It's war and peace, what can we do? And it's the, and it's the environment. Because, you know, as, as we are here, well-off Western feminists, compared with, with other parts of, of the world, you know, there are so, terrible things happening in, in the nature. It, it will, we will have to face it, within, maybe not in my lifetime, but we will have a, enormous problems to face, because nothing is happening. Or, or very, very little. The governments in the world, they refuse to solve these problems. They, they refuse to make a plan. They're just having a meeting in Paris now, I think, and I'm sure nothing will, will come out of it. But when I say this, my, my last point is, I have been discussing this with my friends in the University of, of Iceland, and they say to me, aren't you forgetting something? You know, we are educating hundreds of young feminists they are very active in the social media. They are there. They are sometimes visible, sometimes they are not. And they, but, and they can do a lot. And that's my hope. And, and I, was, I must say I was very optimistic when I came here this morning, seeing all the, the young people. And, you know, we here, different ages. So I think there are, you know, these are two different streams, pessimistic and optimistic. But I, we need to analyze it and we need to find, find ways to fight them. The bad ones. Thank you very much, Kristin. And just to sum up, you know, the biggest challenges as you see it, are it, would that be the angry white men also here in Scandinavia? Yes. Yes. I, I think so. And, and uh, you know, as has been said here, the, you know, for the last, we are, we are going to, we in Denmark and Iceland, we are going to celebrate 100 years of women's right to vote next year. Mm. Both Finland and, and Norway have celebrated Sweden will be coming soon. So, and, so, and, and this, you know, this is an opportunity to, to ask questions. Where are we? What have we done well? And, and we, of course, see that the, the women's movement is the major force in the social changes for the last 100 years. And it still has an enormous role to play. And that's why it's so important that we talk together and, and that we focus on, we, have, we come from different directions, and, and have different views and all of that, and that's good. But we need to focus on, on the main problems threatening women and young girls. Don't, and don't forget the violence. Okay. And um, just to, uh, to, 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 um, to repeat myself from earlier on, because a lot of you came late because of the, uh, the, pro the program over at the arena, I just want to remind you all that if you have any proposals as to what you think the biggest challenges are for feminism and gender equality in the North right now, then the organizers would like to hear from you. And if you look at the high table over there, there is paper and pen for you to write down your proposals. Well, not your proposals, but the challenges, the biggest challenges. And there's a rapporteur here who will try to implement this at the end document. But just to return to the session and to our panelists, you've all talked about, I've, I've heard you talk about the climate, the angry white men. I've heard you talked about the academia and the language which is covering up, uh, should, should be about gender equality, but it's actually covering up that we've not reached where we actually want it to be. But if you have a look at the, the final document, the draft for the final document, what they're talking about there is a lot about finances. And the finances that is supposed to support our women's rights movements in our respective countries. And I've heard none of you say anything about money. Why is that? Of course. Yes, Kristen, please. Of course, money is, is, is important. But I, but I think that, you know, a lot can be done without money. But, of course, it's uh, as I was saying. The, the women's movement is, is is so so important. It's a it's an as a, a social structure, as a, as a social force in, in our societies. That of course the government should support them. And and I would like to to remind us of that the United Nations have 
have emphasized that it's government's duty to support NGOs. And, but we have, I think all of us have seen cuts and women's movements are having difficulties. Sorry. Maybe it's a, it's a part of the, this anti. May I just say that, that we had elections in Iceland last, last year. And, and for the first time for, for, well, how many years? Decades. You know, we are hearing voices in the parliament, you know, anti feminist voices. That hadn't happened for a very long time. And Tori, if, if you'd like to, uh, to elaborate on that. Well, first I'd like to say that um, I've just written a book about, which is called Women of Power, which is about 73 female heads of state and government in 53 countries who have uh, come the last, during the last century and looked at how did I get to so-called power and what happened. And I think one of the conclusions there is very clear. You have to have a democratic system. You have to have an active women's movement. And what I've been asked, what I asked for was the possibilities of being an active, not an actor, active gender movement, but an active women's movement. I mean, it's extremely important to keep the difference that actually in gender you have two parts. One is men and one is women, and the problem is the relationship between them. And we, <laughs> lack money for the women's university, we lack women, money for, for voluntary organizations, we lack money for studies, uh, critical studies uh, of the, the so-called equality policy, but also of women's issues, and, and over the whole scale of, um, of measures which are supposed to create a, a, an increased knowledge, better understanding of society, and an active involvement in improving society, we are lacking funds and involvement, both from the red and green government and so far also from the blue. So it's not only a question of, of color, it's also a question of approach. And, and that's where you have to, you have to go and, and do your propaganda, which was called in the old days. <laughs> And uh, um, it, it's just, I, I've been a part of the, 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 the Danish Women's Council as well. And, you know, we, we've, also been, we've also seen cuts in our funding. And we've had to close pro, uh, projects down and, and so on and so forth. Um, so so what, um, in, in, in your opinion, what does money matter in this? Because when I was on the board of the Women's Council, you know, it's it, when men are on boards, they receive um, they receive money to be on these boards. You know, if, you, if you're in the women's uh, movement, you know, the, you don't receive any money to be on the boards. Is is there also some something that we need to tackle because we're all just happy to be part of this movement? Should we look at it maybe a different way, Tore? Well, we, if you want to have a meeting, you have to pay money for the for the room. If you want to be a consultant to government, you have to have somebody who has time to sit down and read it and then write about it and then express it. I mean, we're doing every, everything on spare time, after work, very tired, and with the basic minimum. Also, in, in our country, the, the, the men get more money to promote so-called equality than women's organizations. And we have problems also doing when we have a chance to influence. We don't have m resources to do it. So, I mean, resources are completely basic. We, we can do a lot of, of work for free, My, bless me, but, but and you can't just do everything for free. And it is in the nature of the situation that women generally have less resources than men. They have less spare time, they have less money, so, I mean, there's not the big things you just can pull a string and uh, down it comes. No, it's very, very hard work. And if you want a democratic society, it's the weakest you have to support so they also can participate, not only the strongest. And Mila, uh, you, you raised your hand. Uh, is that still? Would you still like to say something? Yeah. 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 Ah, yeah. Somebody mentioned a welfare state in, in, uh, in first when we introduced uh, ourselves. But, well, like said, welfare state has been a good friend of a woman in Nordic countries. Of course, it has its four faults and it could be improved. But at the moment, we face the politics that um, we are tearing down a welfare state pretty much in, in every country um, in Nordic. It's, um, it's, a, it's a chosen neoliberal 
politics. It's um, it's been sold to us like uh, we don't have any options. We have to cut the benefits and we have to cut the social services and and people have to to carry more on their own shoulders. The individuals need to take responsibility. The families need to take responsibility. But well, we we, we know that it's 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 not the truth. Um, I could say that uh, I could give you an example about the money and uh, about the women and women's position, because uh, in in Finland we are in really lacking of um, shel shelters for domestic violence victims. There should be uh, over 20, and there is a little bit over 10. And, um, and government's own programs say that they will um, increase the number of shel of shelters uh, in this government period. But they actually there has been closing of sh shelters, and so it's the it's the there is a good will for equality and for for women and women's position. But when it comes to money, there is no money. But is it true? I don't I don't think so. It's about the choices where you where, where you cho choose choose to put the money. And also, you, you talked about the welfare uh, system, and I think that a lot of our countries, uh, the government has been used to having the women's movement. You know, we've been here for over 100 years now, uh, fighting for women's rights. Maybe they're just used to us, and we're going to be there even though we don't get any money. Um, could that also be a problem? You know, we're so passionate about what we do that, you know, we're going to do it even though that we're lacking funding. Binda? Yes, as, as long as I have been in, in the university, we have tried. As long as we, I have been in the, in the university, we have tried to get money for research, and um, sometimes we succeed, sometimes we fail. But in a way that I am a professor today, it's a kind of being paid for doing my activist uh, work. So if I have to choose between money and activism, I think I'll prefer activism. Because I think if you have an active women's movement, we will be all over and, and, and we can get funding. And I mentioned this journal, I'll do it once again, Friction, a Danish journal, and they have uh, managed to get that journal funded. So, so perhaps uh, if we have a, a third wave or fourth, fourth wave of feminist movement, where, where the young people uh, went to go into the street and, and is active and, and, and asking for, for, uh, for a lot of things, then I, then I think that uh, it's, it's more important with activism than with money. And when I was an activist in the 1970s, I mean, we didn't get paid, but we had a lot of results. So um, if I have to say, I think that perhaps the generation problem is bigger than the money problem, and that activism is more important than finances. You said the generation problem. Yes. What, what is it that you mean about the generation problem? I, I mean that, that uh, we have to, it's, it's very important that, that young women uh, participate in the, the women's movement. And do you not find that at the moment? Oh, yes, of course, because, the, we, as I said, we have a lot of uh, students. But I think we, we, have, we haven't had the, what I would call the same uh, with, uh, movement as in the 1970s. That's what we need, a big, you know, a big event uh, which set a new, uh, ask new questions and new challenges. Like the Nordic Forum. Yeah, I'm not sure no. that's the... T no? No, no, <laughs> no okay. I'm not sure. <laughs> as a young woman? Just a yeah, like a short answer as a young woman. Well, I don't know, am I that young anymore? But anyway, <laughs> um, I, I think there is, a, there is a will of young people to be active and be, be um, more active. But life uh, at the moment is so hectic and it's, it's so, um, you have so many things going on. And, um, and work life, it's so hectic and demanding that people, they don't, have, they don't have power, they don't have energy. They are getting burned out before they are 30. So and do I you think, think that that was different also, in the 70s? I don't know. I don't know. But it's been said that it wasn't that hectic. I don't know about my own. I, I wasn't born then, but <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Okay. Eba, you've been, uh, you, you, you had your hand up a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, uh, now, now I, <laughs> um, I, what I wanted to say was that uh, I believe that we absolutely 
desperately need male feminists. I'm happy there's somebody of representing them because they should definitely take a stand against these, uh, what do you call them, white, uh, angry white men, or Kimmins does, angry white men. It's a, it's a huge problem. And uh, that anti-feminism is, uh, uh, well, it's, that it's possible to be um, an anti-feminist as a man is uh, absolutely unacceptable. So we need, um, well, I don't know, a feminist movement of uh, uh, male feminists or something they should uh, organize. Definitely. This is a shame. I mean, every man should uh, think, but it, it's, it's shameful. And that, uh, that we need uh, a domestic uh, violence, uh, which is male violence against women in shelters and what is going on. And the sexualization, the pornography, which makes uh, it more uh, difficult than ever, I would say, since the 1960s to ask what is a, what is a, a good sexuality. I mean, in the, uh, it's, uh, in the heterosexual pornography, it's uh, violence. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's not, we have huge problems with that. Young women who, call, who, who get veganism, you know, different kinds of, um, uh, what is more, they, they think that anal rape is normal. Uh, they, their bodies uh, are violated. Uh, and it's supposedly normal for a 16-year-old uh, boys and girls. Uh, so there's a lot of things to actually debate, and I would like may, men to be in there in this discussion. So more active men in the feminist debate. Definitely. And then I also Definitely. wanted to say something about the welfare state being the... I just need to get Toril yeah. in, in, because you, you, you had your hand up when we were talking about also the money bit. Well, first I'd like to say about the 70s, because I was there, that, I mean, the, 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 the driving force were women who had got education quietly in the years after the war, and then they had been at home, at least in, in my country, and, this, and they, we then started having, uh, needing more labor power, and they came out in the workplace, and they discovered, oh, God, it's not equal, and they got very angry, and so they, in, they involved themselves. But then they discovered that changing society was a long um, range of, of issues and a long haul. So, I mean, they then spread all over and worked to change society, but they were too few and they had too little resources. So, I mean, why we need both activism and money, because this is changing the whole social structure of society where actually men generally benefit and enjoy and have power from their positions, while women in relation to that do not have as much. So it's a question about justice. And therefore, I mean, to, to do this long, broad haul, you have to have active people, women and men, and we didn't get anything without some men supporting us. And, and then you have to have resources to do it. And it's not for today or tomorrow. It's, it, my, my grand, I'm third generation, generation feminist, and still we've got a long way to go. So we have to have resources to be able to keep up the pressure. And we need the pressure not only here, but in the developing countries. And there also, issues sometimes are different, but they need resources. So supporting the women's movement also in other countries is extremely important. Can I just ask if any of you, because we've got all the, the Nordic countries here represented, do any of you have success stories in regards to finances, financing the feminist and gender equality work that you do? Nordisk Forum. <laughs> but other than that, for the work that you do back home, Kristen? Uh, well, I would say that, that, uh, uh, that well, there still is a, a, a lot of support inside the Nordic Council, Council of Ministers, and, and there, is, there is money there. And as you probably many of you know, Nick has, uh, has got money for research, so keep an eye on, on that. But may I continue? Yes, sure. yes, because, well, I would say that, of course, money is, is very, very important, but we must not let it stop us. And I was, I was just thinking if, if there is something that we can learn from, from women in America 
who have a, a very long experience in raising money. I'm sure it's difficult, but maybe sometimes we, we need to, to use other methods than just going to the, to the state or the, the municipalities. So that's just something to, uh, to, to think about. But I was, if I may, uh, what you, you mentioned uh, about uh, the pornographization of, of the public sphere or, or, or the underground sphere or, or what we should call it, uh, that is a part of this ideology that I was mentioning, the, the angry white man. Mm. You know, and, and uh, there is a guest here at Nordic Forum, Gail Dines, who has studied this in, in America, and she, she, is, she is outstanding, and I, I would recommend that you go and listen to her. I had the opportunity last year, and, and, and you know, she draw, draws up that picture of, you know, the, the, this, is a ter this is terrible, this is so terrible, and, and the message is they deserve it. The women, they deserve it. They deserve to be raped. They deserve to be tortured, because this is nothing but torturing, which goes on in these, these pictures. This is all, you know, this, the same ideology, and which is extremely worrying. Uh, but I, I also was thinking, uh, of course, you know, si since the beginning of the, of the 70s, if we look at the history, the women's movement has changed a lot. You know, first it was, uh, well, more or less, but at the beginning it was united, Group Otta you know, the red stockings. And then it, it has spread into many directions. There's a lot of groups working on, on violence against women, sexual abuse. You know, others are working in, inside political parties or, or the labor movement. Or, and, and all of this is good. But as it says in, in this, this statement from Nordic Forum, which I hope you will read, there's a lot of good things in it, that there, uh, and it's, it's our... What we can learn from history is that the women's movements, if we talk about them as, as in plural, many of them, you know, they have managed, they have managed to, well, most of them, to work to, together on special issues, like the right to vote and, and health care for women, uh, and, and now maybe violence. There's a, there is quite an, you know, a widespread support for fighting violence against women. So it, the women's movement, it changes also. It, but I, I think that, as I was saying at the beginning, that maybe we should sharpen our, our focus. But how can we sharpen our focus if, we're so, if there are so many actors of us in society? You're talking about that we have a lot of different groups who are doing maybe some of the same things. How can we sharpen our focus if, we, if maybe... We could talk, that also we, be part of the we problem? We must talk together. That's... Like, like we are doing here, and there are many other fora where, where we can talk together. And we, we have the social media. So we, we can. We, we can. We can use the, the old slogan, get, let's get organized. Bende, you had your hand up. Yeah, I, I think... Uh, what's you need to use the microphone. Yeah. Uh, what's really different from Orbo 94 is uh, that uh, the women's movement is much more international and that EU play a really important role. I can mention since 99, they have been a unit, women and science, and this unit is very important for women in academia in, uh, in, in the Nordic countries and also in Denmark. I could mention Seydau. Seydau has criticized the Danish government for discriminating women in academia. So that, that's, I think we, we kind of get support from abroad on a lot of questions. And then I will say that, that when I mentioned that after Oslo we got a coordinator in women's studies, a Nordic coordinator in women's studies, after Orbo we got Nick, then there is some results where I can see that activist projects now are state institutions or paid by Nordisk minister or, and I think we can follow that, that track and, and we have to, to ask for something after this conference and, and why not, why shouldn't it be possible to get it? So, so you, you can use, you can use, you, you cannot be a historian and uh, not being a pessimist. Posi po pessimist. Pos no, I'm being a pessimist. No. <laughs> so uh, so uh, we, we have seen a lot of changes and probably we will also see them in the future. So I, I, I will see, we, I have one comment for this program, then I think that uh, too much talk about backlash. 
And I, 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 I can't do it. You see progress. It, yes, even if I think we need a lot of money in, at the University for Women's Studies, I see more progress than backlash, yes. Okay. Tori? Well, we managed to um, have the government make two studies about how equality really, gender equality really was in Norway. And those documents were, were shocking. Everybody was shocked because the differences were much greater than they thought. And I think that's where it's important to sharpen the focus. I mean, look at what society really is about and get to know about it. <clears throat> we have very evidently in our country all the time had the, the, the drag between the different powers. I mean, when we got our so-called equality, gender equality law, it was gender neutral. And it still is. It's even more than before. But then the only thing I managed as a member of parliament in that law was to put in and particularly improve the status of women. And that's still there. But then you have uh, the main uh, strategy. You are not, uh, you are not permitted to, to treat genders differently. Huh? How are you going to then uh, reduce differences? So I think, I'm not worried about people being different, um, involved in different issues. We, we need a very broad movement being involved in different issues. But they have to have a focus, which, which is a focus about improving the status of women, wherever women are, the way it is in our society. I mean, even it's, in one area it's power, in another area it's violence, and so on and so forth. If we're all clear that it's about the status of women, and that we have a problem because uh, the, the, the so social structure is unjust on the basis of gender, for women and men, I think then we can do a lot of things. But it takes time. It's not enough to go into the street and wave some, uh, some kettles or something. I mean, it takes a lot of effort and time. And that's where we, we need resources. In your opening uh, uh, words, you said, you talked about... Uh, indirect discrimination also being a big problem. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe uh, say a little bit more about that? I mean, indiscrim indirect discrimination is... Because, you know, if, if, you, if we ask people in a lot of the Nordic countries, a lot of them will say, well, I, I'm sure the majority will say, you know, we have gender equality yeah. in our country. So indirect discrimination, is that where we need to start now? I think you need to be clear about what discrimination is and who you're talking about. Because if you have a law saying you're not allowed to discriminate anybody, well, those will use the law or the best at using laws. We have had one little study about our law on, on, on equality, Likestillingsloven, and she showed that men benefited from the law more than women yeah. because they were better at it and they had more resources to do it. How do you mean? I mean, they, they, generally they had better jobs, they had more money, they had more education, and when they felt that, and they were more sensitive about their rights, so when they felt their rights were not taken care of, they made a fuss. Well, women, they had to go home and take care of the children, and then they had to do a lot of other things. What we, we see now is that, um, when I, in, in the media, I, I said, talked about the, the double workload of women, which, of course, they don't have a double workload. Everything, everybody's equal. But when it comes to it, the women are the one running, rushing home to take care of the children, and they don't have that much pay, and it's a problem of getting an advancement, a job, and so, so on and so forth. And so when we mentioned that in the media, we get a lot of phones and emails from women say, oh, I'm so glad you took up this issue, but I'm too exhausted to do anything about it because I am a mother, working mother. And, and that is a very clear example of where you're not, they're not supposed to be discriminated at all. But it feels like it, doesn't it? Yes, Eva. I just linger upon that because I, ah, at last we're going down to basics. I think that's very important that we have lifelong. I mean, this welfare state being the best friend of, of women, of course, better than in Afghanistan or something. But still, we have a lifelong inequality, a lifelong inequality. Uh, there's so many women who are not affected by our financed academic projects or political uh, rhetorics. Um, in, in, uh, for the uh, retired women, for instance, they have a difference of 5,000 to 7,000 crowns a month. I mean, uh, between, uh, there's a difference between um, men and women. 
and uh, 80 percent in Sweden of the poorest to get the so-called guarantee pension are women and this inequality will not die with us we know that 50 percent of all women who are now in this uh, double workload and currently in the working force 50 percent all, all young women here <laughs> I can say will not be able to live on their pensions so we have to start very basic with you know better wages for women in public service uh, and so forth i mean so so much to do this is not gender equality well, Kristen, you, you, you actually said earlier that, you know, in, in the States they fund the women's movement differently than here, than we do here in, in a lot of the Scandinavian countries. Um, you know, they're able to raise money. Do you think maybe the welfare state is holding us back? That's a good question. Mm. Yeah, but, you know, we, uh, we, we maybe take it as granted that we get support and they, that we, and we have this right to to support to this support, and and, and I think we, we actually we should, but uh, you know, but we I think I'm, what I'm saying is that that you know we cannot accept, we must not let the the money stop us, and we must find other ways. But then, if I may, uh, of course, Bente is is right, and it's very very important that we do not forget how successful the women's movement in the Nordic countries has been. We are at the top of the world concerning gender equality. And, and uh, you know, if, if we look at the figures of women in parliament as members of, of, of uh, go local governments, legislation, protection, ch child care. You know, I, I, I was in, in a meeting in, in New York. The main problem for, for working women in the United States is lack of child care. Mm. It's so expensive. If, if it's there, it's so expensive. It, it, it's, you know, they, they just have to make a, make a choice. Not having children or having enough money to pay for child care. So, you know, these are problems that we have, well, maybe not quite solved, but at least the situation is, is, is much better. And, and we, so we can, we can say in general the situation of women in the Nordic countries is, of course, is much better than it was 40 years ago. And I sometimes... Uh, say to, to young, young women, you know, think about your grandmother when you're complaining about the situation of women. Think about your grandmother or your great-grandmother. We have made steps forward, but of course there is a lot of work to be done. Of course. But you know, when, when you're saying that, then you might also be confirming her in the general opinion that we have uh, reached gender equality. No, no, I'm not. No. <laughs> not at all. We, we, as I say, and I, what I find is it's, it's um, so important that, that we take, we in the Nordic countries take our role as role models seriously. That we, we are role models. People from, if you, if you, some of you maybe have been at the, the, the meetings of the CSW, the Commission on the Status of Women, and you know, there are Nordic site events, and the rooms, they're always full. So that's a lot of people who want to hear how we have managed to change society. What have we done? How is our legislation? So on and so on, so on and so forth. So, but but at this, and we have we have had success, but there are still a, a lot of things to be done. There's not gender equality at all. And but and, and as I'm saying, I'm 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 worried about these streams, you know, going working against us. I think okay. it's, it's a worry. We, we it's have a sign, a, you know, about five minutes there. left until we're going to ask a few questions, take a few questions from the audience. And I'd just like to raise one last issue. The legislature in our respective countries, do you feel that the law is up to date in giving us the framework to work for gender equality in your country? Torit. No. <laughs> and, and, and where it exists, it, it's so vague and, and so ambiguous that uh, it can be used just as much by men and as by women. I mean, we don't have clear legislation that supports the, the measures that are needed to improve the status, the power, and the resources of women in general. We have some specific measures, 
but in general, the, uh, the, the, there is still a lot to be done, and the so-called equality law has just been changed in a negative direction because it's now it's kind of equality for everybody. Now everybody, everybody. So, but don't you think that that might be because of this general opinion that we have gender equality? So what we need now is to focus more on. Uh, equality for ethnic ethnicities and uh, sexualities and so forth? Well, that was just my point, that you have to be specific. And you're talking about either men or women or ethnic groups or whatever, but also in ethnic groups you have men and women, handicapped you have men and women, and wherever you are there are men and women. So, <coughs> so I mean, but you have to be specific, and, and when you use the general terms you cover up. Okay, and a last word from, uh, from Mila, and then we'll take a question. <laughs> okay, thank you. I think that is exactly the problem, that um, the neutrality that we are going to, that we take all the, all, the, all the sayings of men and women off, and then we are th when thinking that, that now we are equal, now we are speaking about everybody when we, when we take those, those forms off, and it's actually leading to blindness. Um, well, I was going to say, tell an example from Finland, because our equal little law, it's been uh, made in uh, 1987, and it's been newly uh, renovated. And some, um, some groups wanted to take their ascendance off, and that is the sentence which, uh, which divines what the law is uh, for, and it's for equality between men and women, and to improve the women's position in labor markets. But there were groups who wanted to take it off because we have, it's, it's, we shouldn't say this kind of a things about that women, then we need to say something about men or we didn't need to say anything about women at all because the equality is not about the saying it. And if we doesn't say what is the real thing, we are not saying anything. Yeah. Okay. We will take a... Um We'll take a, a question from down here, and if you'll first state your name, and then a short question. Yeah, My name is Annika Hirvonen, and, and I'm a politician from the Swedish Green Party. I feel that when working with gender issues, uh, oftentimes there is a strive to sort of show that everyone gains from it, and a big focus has come, for instance, when you look at the difference in results in education on to improve the results of boys because they're uh, lagging behind. And I would say that, well, an equally important perspective is why, why don't women, if they get better results, get better uh, employment, salaries, etc. But I feel that everyone agrees on, on sort of improving the situation for young boys. Uh, and then there is a big debate about professors for, uh, professorships for women. Uh, is there, um, a problem when you sort of uh, try to show that everyone gains from it, that the focus sort of goes to, to, the, to the men that, uh, and, and to improve the situation for the men that do not benefit from, from the current situation. Okay, so when, when we're raising issues about, you know, gender issues, then we're, we're arguing that everybody benefits from it, and in reality it seems like when we're doing that, it ends up being the men who benefit from what we're doing. Do you guys agree on that? Toril? I've never run around saying every, everybody benefits from everything. I mean, uh, I mean, what we want is a more, a more just society. A society where you can uh, use your resources and where you can, can um, live a, a, a happy life, uh, regardless of, uh, of if you are a woman or a man. And of course it's more sensitive for men because they are the ones who are advantaged in the present system. I mean, they generally get more support, more education, more money, more resources and more power. Now it's always, not all that is necessarily always nice for everybody at every time, but, but that, what, what they do. So of course it's not easy for them. And, and it's not easy to, to kind of, but then you have to look at what kind of society do you want? But and I, I think, think that what, what, what you said down there, when you presented your argument, it's also about, you know, when, when I've heard, for example, from the European women's lobby, when they're starting to frame their, uh, uh, a question and when they want to get into dialogue with the right, then they'll frame it from a humanistic angle. And that is when you say that, you know, this is good for everybody. And that also sometimes 
uh, ends up being part of the problem, actually. Yes, but I mean, what is, when you say good for everybody, what does that mean? I mean, we want a better society and where many will have ad advantages because they will, for example, men will probably be less uh, controlled, less uh, uh, strained, have a, a better life. But it's not according to, necessarily according to all dimensions in the present society. I mean, and, and you can't go into all individuals either. We're talking about social structures. We're talking about groups. We're talking about general allocations of power, resources, and status. I just, uh, okay, um, let's, just, just, uh, I, no, let's no. just take another question because we only have 10 minutes for this last session. Ah. So uh, please state your name and a short question. Anna Harbo for Friction magazine. So Bende. Yeah. Please speak English. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which Bende was talking about. We're a new Danish magazine. But, uh, okay, what? I was okay. I was talking about or thinking about this at a more governmental level because it seems that all the Nordic uh, parties or the governments are in cahoots in this uh, um, in the gender uh, gender and equality uh, politics that they are focusing now on pluralism instead of uh, changing patriarchal norms. So isn't this a structural level that we have to address? Because we also, when we seek funding, we have to downsize the, no, we're not queer feministic, we're all about equality for everybody, because, or else we won't get funding. And we know this. Does anybody want to, to take that one? Yeah, Linda? Let, let me try, because when we have to argue, um, um, in, uh, in Denmark, it's uh, much easier to argue for diversity. And I think um, diversity is very important, uh, it's a democratic principle, but I also think that, as Toril said, well, we have to be concrete. When is it gender diversity? When is it diversity for other, other people? And it seems, at least in Denmark, that, that uh, diversity sometimes is ruling out the gender perspective. So uh, I think you are right that we still have uh, to um, go for the, the patriarchal and male domination in, in, in society. But I must say that somewhere my vision is that, that equality is a more broad concept that's only for women and men. No. Yes. Yes, 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 of course. And, and you have to fight the, the patriarchal society and, and even think and hope that this is also a fight which can engage men because I think a lot of men are kind of hurt by the patriarchal society. Mm -hmm. And if men benefit uh, from equality when it comes to, for instance, that they get a better relationship to their, to their children and that when they are more engaged in family, I, I, I really think it's, then it's fine for me. But, but it's uh, in, in other ways that, that perhaps ben, uh, men benefit from, uh, from uh, equality. And we in Denmark have even a, a worse equality law than in, 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 in Norway because you can't do anything for women without getting a dispensation. You, there is a kind of, of a mouse hold in, uh, in the Norwegian, in Norwegian law. So, as I read in the newspaper, you can see that, that it's men who complain about inequality. And um, I, 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 I think that that's perhaps a problem, that separatism nowadays is forbidden. You can't do anything for men or, or, or women. You have to be integrated all over. And, and, and that's perhaps a new problem. And I was thinking when they had said to the Red Stocking mo movement in the 1970s that we had to work with men, I mean, that would be been a riot. <laughs> and we had been fined or had to pay a lot of money because, because that's uh, what's going on in, in Denmark nowadays. And we have a, a last question from the audience before we need to wrap this up. And please state your name and your question. Uh, my name is Olga Suihkonen. I live in Finland, but I'm Serbian national. Uh, I'm, my question is going to be a, a little bit of continuation 
of the previous one and what uh, has already been mentioned, uh, the laws and indirect discrimination in laws. What we have in uh, Nordic countries, as I understand, are gender-neutral family laws. Uh, what are feminists planning to do about it because gender neutral family laws have a disproportionate effect on mostly women and we know what is going on right uh, uh, in a legal processes where who is more likely to leave their career and stay at home to support spouses career men or women so we cannot have gender neutral laws in a property and in pension uh, um, and, uh, and also that question has been addressed by the uh, committee, or SEDAO committee, in um, concluding observations for okay. 2014. Okay. I hope you read it. Okay, so uh, the question here is the gender neutral family laws, are they actually, sh should they not be gender neutral? Yes, Mila. Yeah, thank you. I could an answer very shortly that um, feminist movement in Finland and women's movement in Finland and our organization is uh, very much in favor of this so-called 666 model. <laughs> no, um, it's, I know it's can in can use. Can you speak so we others, so yeah. others can understand as well? <laughs> it's in, in, uh, in some other countries as well, but it's a bit shorter, I think, in Iceland, yes. So it's a, a six for another parent, six months for a, a, another parent, and six months for another and that one six-month period, they can choose who uses it. Kristen, uh, you had, uh, is, that, is that for this question? No, okay, then Torrid, please take it. Well, we have pro problems because, I mean, they give the father m more rights than before to be a, a father and be at home, which is wonderful, but they don't consider the women's rights and they don't consider the children's needs. And actually, in the first, particularly the first year of a child's life, the, the woman and the man are not exactly in the same situation. I mean, uh, the man does not have to recover from a birth, and the man actually does not do breastfeed and things like that. So, I mean, you have to have some kind of measures that, that take into account not only the, the pleasures and delight of being fathers, but also the, the pleasures and delights of being mothers and the needs of the children. And, and that so, is so where we're we not have, good enough. So, so is, it, is, is it a good thing that we have gender-neutral family laws? We can't have completely gender-neutral family laws if you want it to make sense in people's lives. So no. 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 Okay. Christian? Yeah, well, I just wanted to mention that in, in Iceland we have had the so-called 3 plus 3 plus 3, nine months altogether, three for the mother, three for the father, and three to share. It was going to be 12 months, but it, it has been cut down, and, and changing the system into 5 plus 5 plus 2. That was quite five months for the father. It would be interesting to see how it how it worked on the labor market. But it's it's clear that this legislation has had an well quite a lot of effect in the sharing of of housework and in, in and especially in bringing up the children. But f finally, if I may say my final words now, I think we, it's connected to this that we have to have in mind that our governments being even being the best in, in the world, they have international obligations. And it's the seat of convention, it's the Beijing platform for action, and these, both uh, these, uh, you know, the platform and, and the convention, the Beijing uh, declaration, it's written from the point of view of women. It's, it's for supporting uh, and the, uh, the empowerment of women. And I think we should take a better look at these, these, uh, conventions and these, these very, very important declarations, they do also, they can do a lot for us in the Nordic. Okay. I'm sorry, but I need to sum it up now, the, uh, this session. Uh, thank you to all our, uh, all the guests here in, in the session. Uh, what I've heard you all say uh, today is that we need to have a new language for how we speak about gender equality because the present one is actually being used to cover up inequalities at the present moment. I've also heard you talk about the different agendas that exist for, uh, for example, in, in, in Sweden, the Swedish women's movement and ethnic minority women's movements, that they should actually collaborate more and that would benefit the, both of them. 
And I've also heard you talk about um, uh, the angry white men. The angry white men in that we should have more focus on men in general and getting them involved in the women's movement and in feminist questions. Because, as a lot of you have pointed out, it is actually both to women's and men's advantage if we get a more uh, equal society and a more open society where you get to choose what your gender or your exact way of, uh, of being a man or a woman, if that is up to you and not up to the gender stereotypes. And we also got to take a turn into the finance part, and we're all agreeing that finance is very important for the women's movement to move forward in these questions. But I've also heard you say that a lot of you would actually be doing the work that you're already doing, even though that the finance wasn't there. Um, and if, if there is any last, and oh yeah, we, we, uh, um, we also talked about the laws, and a lot of you actually, uh, two of the questions that we had time from, from, uh, from the room here talked about the laws and that maybe it's not always to our advantage when we're talking about how feminism is and, you know, I already said that, you know, that feminism is both to the men and the women's advantage. But, you know, sometimes it's really not. It ends up being to the men's advantage more than it is to the women's advantage. So that also needs to be, um, to be directed in some sort of way. And last of all, I'd just like to say thank you to all our panelists here today, to Kristin Estgeilsdottir. Uh, Ebba Witt-Bratström, Torit Skard, and Bende Rosenbeck and Mila Pykkönen. Thank you so very much for being here. <laughs>